Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here to say a few words this morning. It's a pleasure to, to meet you, and I hope we'll have a bit of a discussion around some of the things that I'd like to say. I, I begin by telling the story of a young man <coughs> who in 1785 was ploughing a field in Ayrshire in Scotland. As he did so, a mouse ran across the field, and he realised he'd destroyed the mouse's nest, and thus the safety and home of that creature. So he composed a poem about the episode, and as Stuart has already said, it contains a key line. The poem goes, I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes you startle at me, thy earthbound companion, and fellow mortal. The young man was the poet Robert Burns, and the poem was called To a Mouse. He realized that he was part of nature and that his actions could disturb and destroy the environment and wildlife and could break nature's social union. He reflected on the relationship between humans and the natural world. And of course, the future of our world depends on that relationship as well as our happiness and well-being. As I'll mention in a moment or two, animal species are being extinguished at 100 times the normal rate. We need to change things to reverse the habitat loss, over-exploitation for economic gain, and tackle climate change and sustainability. And these are some of the things I'd like to uh, talk about for a wee while this morning. I just wanted to give one or two definitions just to clarify my own mind about what I was talking about. First is sustainability. That, I think, can be defined as the amount or degree to which the Earth's resources can be exploited without damage to the environment, including animals, birds, and wildlife. The second is global warming. That's the gradual increase in overall temperature of the Earth's atmosphere, generally attributed to the greenhouse effect caused by increased levels of carbon dioxide, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, and other pollutants. And thirdly, the word power. Power in the context of this paper really can have two meanings, meanings, both of which are relevant. The first equates power with energy, how it's generated, used, and its consequences. And second, it takes the meaning to a different level, and the power here is about the means and ability to manage and implement change and improve the world as we know it. So these two meanings are actually relevant. Power in the sense of energy, then, raises many issues, including ethical, health, risk, uncertainty, effects on the environment, land, sea, and air, housing, heritage, culture, well-being, and happiness. The evidence base around each, uh, the impact of each of these is pretty critical. Uh, and what you should be thinking about uh, during this presentation, and perhaps raise at the end in discussion, is that what you're going to do about global warming and climate change. And that's the first question for you, and I have another one in a moment or two. Some of the reasons why these topics are important to me relate to my wish to ensure that the earth continues to flourish. I love the hills and the sea, the birds and the animals, and I'm fortunate to have a home on a Scottish island. And as of yesterday, I was walking along the beaches. I can see the seals and the porpoises, and in the hills, I can see the eagles, the deer, and, and the red squirrels. And that makes me very happy to do that. And therefore, central to this paper is the concept of happiness and well-being, and my passion, really, that we do have a, a future ahead of us. We need to ensure the future. So what I want to do is explore briefly the nature of happiness. I hope it will encourage you to consider different views on, on happiness and come to your own conclusions as to its place in your lives and places these in the context of global warming. This discussion on happiness is not a digression, but central to the understanding the importance to us all of climate change. I begin my exploration of this subject by considering happiness at the level of the individual, you and me, uh, in addition to some more social, societal, and political perspectives about happiness. So I want first to begin with some conclusions 
I mean, I know that's not the normal way around, uh, and we'll try and refine it as we go. And there will be another question for you to answer. First then, happiness is an individual emotion. It's what matters to you that counts. Secondly, love is the source of happiness, and happiness and love are related. Uh, happiness and, and the heart and love are related. Happiness is expressed as having a purpose and meaning in life. To be happy requires action. It's not a passive emotion. It's not in uh, attaining titles or wealth that matters, but what you do with them. Unhappiness, of course, will always occur, and it's how we deal with it that matters. The spiritual dimension is relevant, but not necessarily to everyone. Freedom is an important part of happiness. The political system and the social context are also very relevant. And in terms of environmental issues, including global warming and the conditions we live in, they too can affect our happiness. So let me uh, deal with some of these in a little more detail in a moment, but I want to ask my, my second question. Let me begin with a quotation. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Or where your riches are, there will your heart be. And the question to you is, where are your riches? What really matters to you? And in particular, how important is the earth to you? To you? Is our planet one of your riches? So I'd like you to think about that during this discussion. Uh, and your answers will define what happiness means for you what matters most to you, and to allow you to see if you're spending enough time on each of these. And, of course, we are saving the planet comes in that list. Is it on the list or is it not on the list? I'll try and illustrate these points with some quotations which have inspired me, though I will not use happiness as a cigar called Hamlet, uh, not just because of my public health background, but I don't think it's a terribly good quotation. Some of you will not realize what that's about, but there was a, a very nice cigar called Hamlet at one point, uh, and that happiness was a cigar called Hamlet. So first of all, happiness is an individual emotion. It's what matters to you that counts. Happiness is about you as an individual, and you don't need to become somebody else. It's within you to be happy. Love is the source of happiness, and a return to the 1960s, and all you need is love by the Beatles. Uh, a lovely quotation from Ezra Pound, what thou lovest well remains, the rest is dross. So what really matters to you comes to the top. What is worthwhile for you? Uh, what gets you up in the morning coming to conferences like this? What gives you purpose and meaning? And I saw a lovely thing from Jonathan Sachs, who was until recently the chief rabbi. This is a story of three men quarrying for rocks. And when asked what they were doing, one replied, breaking rocks. The second said, earning a living. And the third said, building a cathedral. And it's your perspective that matters in what you do. And happiness doesn't necessarily require big things to happen. Again, another lovely quotation from Cahil Gibran. It is in the dew of little things that the heart finds its morning and is refreshed. And I've just got two lovely grandchildren whom I will see on the island of Ireland perhaps tomorrow morning if I get back in time. And these are little things which just make everything wonderful. But the other point is that happiness requires action. You don't just sit back and say, I think I'll be happy today. It requires energy, which raises the concept of entropy, which some of you will know about. Entropy is a physical concept which describes the process by which systems uh, fall into disorder without energy putting them back again. Happiness is thus the consequence of action by you or someone else. It may not, and it perhaps should not, be the primary objective. Helping others, is thus, uh, particularly those less fortunate, is a key aspect, and saving the planet would be another. This is all about making a difference. Happiness is thus a consequence. It happens by doing someone, something either by yourself or someone else. It wasn't being a distinguished professor that made me happy. It was the people I met as a consequence and what I was able to do to help them. 
Just two further quotations. The first from The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. And the key bit is, mercy is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. And then a quotation from Adam Smith, one of the great economists in the world in the uh, Enlightenment in Scotland, was also, of course, a moral philosopher. Howsoever selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others, though he derives nothing from it but the pleasure of seeing it. And from a, an economist, the concept that you might be interested in people because what you do might help them, although you derive nothing from it. The next issue I raised, of course, was the spiritual dimension. How much does it matter? Can you be happy without a religious faith? For some, religion can give meaning to life and a value base. Perhaps, however, this is a subject of another talk. The next point is, is freedom. Freedom to speak, to choose, to act, within the law, of course. And the political system is key to that. The other thing I mentioned was the relevance of social and political systems. And I've chosen some quotations from someone called Robert Owen. He was Welsh, uh, but was a great social and political reformer and set up a place called New Lanark in Scotland. And three quotations from him. Individual happiness can be increased and extended only in proportion as he actively endeavours to increase and extend the happiness of all around him. Again, supporting the idea that happiness comes from helping others. The role of government is to generate happiness. It follows that every state, to be well governed, ought to direct its chief attention to the formation of character, and thus the best governed state will be that which possesses the best national system of education. An interesting thought. Good, good government is one that lets you sleep easily at night and to provide care when we need it. By providing safety, the state grants the freedom to pursue happiness. So that goes from the individual that we've discussed through to the importance of the social and political system. And the last point I raised under happiness was environmental issues and happiness. Your home, housing, work, uh, big issues of the day may all cause unhappiness. Dirt, poverty, pollution, climate change, how we travel to work by train or car, by cycling or walking. It is a responsibility in all of us to ensure that the environment is cared for. The key to happiness, I think, is how we deal with problems and disappointments. And I came across a lovely book called Creative Suffering by Paul Tournier. And then he says, events give us joy or pain, but our growth is determined by our personal response to both, by our inner attitude. What matters is how we deal with the problems. They're not going to go away, but we have to tackle them. So in summary, at this point, do all the tasks that fall to you to the best of your ability. Stick true to your values and remember others in whatever you do. Do what you love doing, where your riches are. Seek help in whatever way you wish when you need it. Smile a lot. It really confuses people. And it's ter I have a terrible habit of smiling. And people don't quite know what I mean. And you, you've got to watch out. So today, you should, should smile a lot, please. And happiness will certainly find you. Now to repeat your second question. Are you spending the right amount of time in each of your riches, the things that matter to you? Uh, and what about issues related to the planet? This brief discussion on happiness was to place the whole issue of sustainability and global warming in a different context. The future is about you and your families and the long-term future of the world, their happiness and yours. So let's return to energy then for a moment. It's clear that we need energy to function and to maintain our well-being. It's also equally clear that the consequences of energy generation are important and can have major negative effects. The overall negative impact relates to global warming and climate change. 
There is little doubt that the evidence supports the fact that the generation of energy is warming the climate and having a very major effect on sustainability, and this is now widely, widely recognised. And I think that's quite an important statement. Most people, I think, agree that the climate is warming and what, why it's doing that is probably our fault. Just in the last few months, there have been some statements from a, a variety of groups and institutions on climate change. For example, the Pope uh, circulated an encyclical, The Care of Our Common Home, for wide discussion. The Lancet Commission on Health and Climate Change produced further evidence of health consequences. And the outcome of a major study from the USA was published which notes that mass extinction uh, is now underway and we are now entering the sixth great mass extinction event. In some quarters, this is now being called the Anthropocene era, where the extinction of species and other events is directly related to human activity. At a recent climate action rally, there was a notice which said, there is no planet B. We have only one Earth. So let me look at some of these things in more detail. The encyclical from the Pope was circulated worldwide. It openly speaks of the devastating effect of climate change on people and the planet. It notes that it is our responsibility as stewards of the earth that we need to care for our world and not steal resources for future generations. Climate change is real, urgent, and must be tackled. It requires long-term policies, international agreements, governmental commitments and full engagement of every sector of society, business and community. It says, and this is a nice phrase, a common guilt binds us, a common interest unites us, a common fate awaits us, a common responsibility calls us. A very powerful argument for change in which everyone needs to be involved. The next paper I mentioned was the Lancet Commission uh, on climate change, and this was published in June of this year. Like other documents, it recognises that all sectors need to be involved, the private sector, health organisations and individuals all have an, an important part to play. It emphasises the need for national and international policy makers to show leadership uh, and act with urgency. The document unequivocally states that current global warming scenario shows that with current greenhouse gas emissions, there will be global warming between 2.6 and 4.8 degrees rise, much higher than the expected two degree rise. This is unacceptably high and a potentially catastrophic risk to human health. The direct effects of climate, heat waves, storms, forest fires, floods and droughts or those indirectly mediated agricultural losses, changing patterns of disease, social structure, migration and conflict pose very significant threats to human health. And the figures are startling. And these are figures from that pub, uh, publication. Three billion additional exposure events of heat wave to elderly populations. And when you get as old as Stuart and I, this really matters. 1.4 billion additional person drought exposure events, 2 billion additional flood events annually by the end of the century. The Commission argues that by placing public health at the centre of climate change policy, this has the potential to unite all actors behind a common cause. If so, 2.2 million lives could be saved each year by 2100 as a result of cutting carbon emissions. And these are astonishing figures. And the recommendations that they have include protecting cardiovascular and respiratory health through the rapid phasing out of coal from the global energy mix. Encouraging a transition to cities that can support lifestyles that are healthy for the individual and the planet. Energy efficient buildings, transport, access to green spaces, reducing urban, urban pollution. Establish a framework of strong, predictable and international carbon pricing mechanism to put the country on a low carbon pathway. Ensure that the impacts of 
national energy policies are built into government regulations and decision-making processes. Invest in climate change and public health research, monitoring and surveillance to ensure a better understanding of health needs and the benefits of climate mitigation at local and national levels. All of this supports the impact of climate change and the need to reduce greenhouse gases. There needs to be agreement at international levels to make the changes. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which meets in Par Paris in November, December of 2015, this year, provides such an opportunity. The third issue I mentioned was a recent major study from the United States which has concluded that the Earth has entered a new period of extinction. This, much of this was new to me when I realised just how far things had come. The study came from Stanford, Princeton and Berkeley and said that vertebrates were disappearing at a rate 114 times faster than normal. The last event was 65 million years ago, probably related to a large meteor hitting the Earth when the dinosaurs were ex eliminated. For example, since 1900, 400 vertebrate species have disappeared, and such a loss would normally be seen over a period of 10,000 years. The major causes relate to climate change, deforestation, and pollution. The scientists involved noted that if it, if it is allowed to continue, life would take many millions of years to recover, and our species itself, i.e. humans, you and me, it would likely to disappear early on. And this is the Anthropocene area. And when you see it written in terms as strong as that, you begin to recognise that this actually matters. These three papers, out of many, many more, show just how serious the problem is and indicates the rapidity of the process. And something needs to be done, and done quickly. There was another event on the 24th of June 2015 in Holland. Is there anybody here from Holland? Just out of interest. Good. Which also merits uh, discussion. It concerned a legal ruling in which 886 Dutch citizens decided to sue the government because they had not implemented climate change quickly enough. And the court ruled that the government's stance on climate change was illegal and ordered them to take action to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 25% within the next five years. The precedent for this event uh, triggering similar legal cases elsewhere is really very interesting and very clear. So we should thank the Dutch for that. Thank you very much. You'll take that back, will you? Okay. Looking back over the centuries, energy has been generated in many different ways. The sun, the wind, on land, sea, tidal power, floating wind, coal, electricity, gas, petrol, oil, nuclear, fracking, biomass, water ex extraction from hot, wet rocks, to name but a few. Each of these carries possible risks for the environment and for health. And it's salutary to look back on my own life in the 1950s in the city of Glasgow, which Stuart and I know well. Major industrial city, full of smogs and fogs, they were extremely common, had a major effect on respiratory disease and on rickets due to the lack of sunshine. Children in Glasgow did not see the sun not because it wasn't there, but because of the fogs. And I recall as a student walking home in front of the bus because the bus couldn't see the road or the pavement and somebody had to go out and walk and the bus came after us. Now, that doesn't happen now. We have a beautiful city uh, and the Clean Air Act of 1956 and subsequent ones changed all of that and it was a major public health advance. So there are many uh, examples of risks involved in things. For example, the incredible waste of food. An article appeared in a Scottish newspaper this week which said that each household throws away about £450 worth of waste food every year. Multiply that by the 
population of Scotland and the families, and you get close to a billion pounds worth of food waste being thrown away. Population growth has been another major issue uh, as the food required to feed this increased population is very significant. And it's meant new methods of intensive agriculture, which has used valuable land, resources, and changed habit. And that returns us to Robert Burns ploughing his field and destroying the mouse's nest. There are also possible risks to heritage and nature of the countryside, as large buildings, wind farms, roads, and pollution can change the landscape and spoil the views and amenities for the population. This is particularly the issue of wind farms, as built on land which has special scenic value or heritage significance may be very significant. And one of my previous roles was chairman of something called the National Trust for Scotland, which looks after about 120 popular, uh, uh, buildings and land in Scotland. Beautiful areas, glens, lochs, rivers. Putting large wind turbines on top of these could make a very big difference to how beautiful the places are. So there are conflicts all around. The question really is what are we going to do about it? And this relates to the second meaning of the word power. The evidence is clear that the climate is warming and this is the result of human activity, whether it's continued use of fossil fuels or wiping out of the landscape. There is little dispute about the evidence. One issue which could be tackled is to bring the competing industries uh, with vested interest together to discuss how things might be improved. There's still much of the science to be taken forward, for example, in the better storage of energy or carbon capture storage. Lord Kelvin, a very distinguished scientist, once said, once said, when you're up against a problem, there's a discovery to be made. And I think there are many more discoveries still to be made in bringing people together in looking at areas where we could do things better and in changing the technology. So new science and innovation are critical if we're going to change things for the better. There's also been increasing debates, which you may have been part of, about disinvestment in fossil fuel companies by companies and institutions. Indeed, as recently as last week in the British Medical Journal, there was an editorial on the subject uh, which said that why are we investing in fossil fuel companies when they're destroying the environment? We should remove our investments and put them somewhere else. Others argue that being active shareholders in such company uh, means that they can change uh, the practice uh, through a dialogue and constructive engagement, uh, and that might well be the case. But what it did raise was the interesting uh, way in which the problems of changing climate change are very similar to the problems of changing cigarette smoking. We have the same big business issues who want to continue to sell cigarettes, and we have sufficient evidence to suggest, to suggest that smoking cigarettes is very bad for you. Why do they continue to do it? They continue to do it because they make money out of it. And that, I think, is uh, an interesting argument in relation to climate change too. However, if I could just return then to what to do about climate change. I came across a book by von Clausewitz, a 19th century Prussian general, uh, and the title of the book was On War. And it makes the point that there are four things required if you wish to win a war. And as in this instance, it's the war against greenhouse gases. The first thing you need to do is to have political will. Without having everyone behind a plan to change things, the, the uh, impact will be slow and regularly challenged. This is the first key point for change. It requires the cooperation of governments across the world to put aside differences and come together, work together to make a real difference. And the discussions have been ongoing for years, and now I think is the time to act. And it's interesting, as I go through these four points, I have this terrible problem of making lists of things and things I'd like to do. And when they don't work, it is one of these four problems that's the case. There's either not the political will there. Or the second thing is to have an effective strategy. 
to ensure that the targets are set, are implemented, and these targets can be at the level of government or communities or individuals. So you need the political will, you need a decent strategy, and the third thing you need is people on the ground, field commanders, who fully understand the issues and the strategy and have the power and initiative to get on with it. Local leaders who can get involved with local communities and ensure that change occurs. And there's an important aspect here of people changing as well as organisations. And you and I will have to do things differently and I'll return to that later. And the final point is to have a supply line of resources. That might mean money, uh, but it could mean uh, people with skills and expertise wishing to change the world. So these are the four points he makes. And it, as I say, in, in, in personal terms, I've looked at these when I wanted to do something. Why has it not worked? The political will, a good strategy, people on the ground to deliver, and resources of one sort or another. May be money, might not necessarily uh, be money. The key then to change, I think, is political will. And there are many examples of individuals who have changed the world by their own efforts and energies. You just take Florence Nightingale in terms of changing nursing, for example, or pioneers against slavery, advocates of women's rights, human rights. Uh, people have been able to change things in the past, major things. And the Dutch example, which I mentioned earlier, shows how change, people can change things and that leg legislation, and it could have a very powerful uh, influence. But at some point, the talking has to stop and we have to do something about it. One of the interesting questions is how did such people bring about change? The people who stopped slavery or human rights change or women's rights. I think they used the power of stories as well as the evidence base. They use their passion to make things better. And I've elsewhere called this the contagious theory of behavior change. The ability to use the power of the word to make people and institutions think and behave differently. The use of social media, for example, has shown just how powerfully and how rapidly changes can be communicated and implemented. And the power of the word can be written, spoken, acted, or through the visual arts. Ideas are very contagious and need to be presented in a way which me makes people think about what they do and want to make a difference. And one of my other interests in the past has been the relationship between the arts and humanities and health. And the two do interact, they are not separate, and things can be improved by using uh, the ideas of the writer or the poet, or indeed the visual arts. So we need to look at ourselves and our own behavior, our own energy use, the way we get around, how we heat our houses, how much food we use, etc. I wrote a little book a few years ago called The Potential for Health. And the focus of the book is that we already know a great deal about health how it, and how it can be improved. We certainly need more research and information, but at present, we could do a lot more with the information and evidence that we currently have. Take smoking cigarettes, obesity, alcohol excess and drugs, uh, the need to take more exercise and mobility, to name but a few. We know that's what we should do. The question is, are we doing it? And if we added to that list the health consequences of global warming, we can begin to see the potential for long-term health gains. The potential is clear, we just need to do it. And if I return to the 18th century and the poet Robert Burns and another poem, he uses some powerful words which are relevant to this story, and I will anglicise it if that's all right so that you might even understand it. Oh, would some power the gift give to us to see ourselves as others see us? It would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. If we could just see ourselves properly and what we do, it might just make us change a little bit. I'm not sure if you know the writer Alexander McCall Smith. He writes some beautiful works. And in one of his books called Friends, Lovers and Chocolate, he uses the term acrasia. He 
Is that a phrase that you know? Interestingly, I, I wasn't aware of it. It's a Greek term, which means knowing that you're doing something wrong, but continue to do it. You know, when, when I ate too much last night, I knew I was eating too much last night, but I quite enjoyed it and I took it. I haven't been for my walk this morning, but I should have been. So there's so many ways in which we can improve the environment and our health. And while we know what they are, we just don't change. And that, I think, is going to be one of the key parts of changing our planet. So what does this all mean for me? How will it affect my children and my grandchildren? I suspect, with, with no real evidence in this, that most people are aware of global warming and climate change. But there is little realisation as to its impact on them at a personal level. And I think that's maybe quite a good little research project to do, to see if people know what climate change is and what's happening, and ask them, but what would it mean for you? And they might not know that. And that, I think, is one of the ways in which the contagious theory becomes quite important. Uh, and, uh, as I say, the present time in the UK is not the same as the 1950s. Uh, with smog and fog, as we mentioned a minute or two ago. With dirt and filth, there was an increasing and immediate realisation that this mattered to health and well-being, and that something had to be done about it. Now the dangers are perhaps less personally evident, but just as dangerous, which is why focusing on public health implications might be the way of raising awareness and interest in global warming. It would make the dangers real, and something that needed to be tackled with urgency. Telling the stories of the health consequences would raise the profile and makes a, the global concept focus on the individual. So we may have to think, you may have to think differently about how things are presented. This would, I think, emphasize that the international discussions are not just theoretical, that they mean something for me and my family if they're not dealt with now. So what could I do personally? And this was one of my difficult things, trying to work out what I could do. First of all, I could talk about it. I could champion uh, change and raise issues about climate change. Secondly, I could reduce my own personal energy consumption. I tend to have at least three televisions on at home and two computers which go all the time. You know, I could switch them off occasionally and that would save some electricity. I could travel differently and get less use of the car, and I've already done that significantly in my hometown. I very rarely use the car now. I could walk and cycle more. I could lose weight and eat less. I could buy less food and reduce waste. And I could heat my, heat my house in a different way. These are all things that I could do, that you could do, that we could contribute uh, to global warming. At the beginning, I had two questions for you. First was, what makes you happy? And secondly, what are you going to do about global warming? And I hope you've answered them by the end, and I'd like to hear what your answers are. And in conclusion then, we all need energy to provide a means to live in this world. But the consequences of the way in which energy is generated and the risks involved are equally clear. Things will have to change, and this will only come about by using the evidence available, by telling the powerful stories of the effects and consequences. Focusing on the public health dimension and the impact on people might be a good way forward. This contagious process could transform people and the world so that we can continue to be part of nature's social union and save the planet. We need to see ourselves as other serious and think differently. Thank you very much. <laughs>